12 this morning on Sirius XM, channel 375. Early signing day. But remember, first year of this 2018, 65% of the total class signed in this day. 77% last year, and that number should be at least 77% again this year. Let's talk about it with R.J. Young from the Tulsa Sports Animal, also OU 24-7 and YouTube as well. R.J., good morning, sir. How are you? All right, brother. Nice to be with you. Hey, Dave, how you doing? Good, bud. Well, um, let's start first with your big get, Joel Klatt, who you've been chasing to get on your show. <laughs> finally uh, finally came on your show. So uh, what, was, what was Joel Klatt's interview like on your show, and, and what was the most impressive or important thing that he said? It was the culmination of a lot of things. Uh, I had asked him to come on my show, uh, actually like on the YouTube channel, like a year ago. And he said he would try to get it worked out. And this is November 2018. And folks knew it because they follow me on Twitter or YouTube. And they understood that for Oklahoma fans, Joel Klatt is basically uh, Keith Jackson, right? And that's Big Ten, that's Big 12. He does such a great job of real-time analysis and whatnot. And so that was that was huge because, as you know, Ari, the the – the gets for your show also helped to substantiate you in a really weird way. But I asked them about, hey, how does Oklahoma defend LSU and how do they attack LSU? And it was really cool to hear him talk about it. And he was saying, look, run the ball about 40 times, play single high over the top, hope that you can get you know those guys to take a few more steps and not give them free releases uh, because that Charlie's Angels trio of wide receivers for LSU is really, really good. And control the clock and also take advantage of that front seven with you know this battering ram with over 100 and I guess close to 200 attempts now with 1,255 yards that is Jalen Hurts and hope that you'll get some one-on-one opportunities with C.D. Lamb and he liked that matchup against what he said with any defense back in the country C.D. Lamb has an advantage so that was cool and that that was very well fulfilling. Uh, R.J., tell me about this recruiting class. We're, we're kind of following this thing as the ebb and flow of it and what's going on with uh, with Oklahoma. you got uh, 10 kids that are already committed. looks like there's uh, another 10 that are hard commits that are certainly coming to OU. But uh, it's weird because we were just talking about the five-star, four-star thing, and only one five-star kid uh, in the Big 12 right now, and I guess he's the, the running back going to Texas. But uh, tell me about Oklahoma and, and how you feel about what they're doing. Oh, right on, Dave, because like, this is this – is... Christmas for me like I live for December 8th and I live for this day those are the two days I feel like I'm geared to just <laughs> go after so the kiddo you're talking about at Texas is Bajan Robinson and he has the talent to flip a po- program he's that good and Texas fans should be very excited about him I love his upside I know Oklahoma went after him pretty hard when he committed to Texas he stayed committed to Texas he's gonna sign with Texas now for Oklahoma a three-year commitment in Jace McClellan seems to be completely off the board, and this has happened just in the last 48 hours to 24 hours, depending on who you want to talk to. And basically what it comes back to is Nick Saban came in with a really hard sell to Jace McClellan, who was once listed as a five-star tailback. He's the number 43 player in the country, but he was also the crown jewel of this 2020 class for Oklahoma. Talking about five foot 5'11", 202 pounds, 4.5 second 40 yard dash speed 40 inch vertical this kid is college ready right now like he uh i think an nfl scout used this term he said flesh bomb which i'm not sure you're supposed to say but this kid is <laughs> built like uh like your brick outhouse you know what i mean and the idea that he would flip his commitment after three years of courtship not just with oklahoma but with a staff that hasn't changed right i mean the running backs coach is the same guy the wide receivers coach, the inside wide receivers coach, the play caller, the offensive coordinator. So we're all wondering what happened except to say, you know, Nick Saban is Nick Saban, and he does this. He's done this year after year after year. He's able to swoop in late with an offer, swoop in late with an in-home visit, and he ends up taking not just one of your kids but your best kid, right? Another kid that flipped to Alabama that was in this 2020 class everybody's really excited about is Drew Sanders. He seems like he's going to sign. This is one of these supreme athletes that Oklahoma really wanted to play some tight end. And Nick Saban said, hey, why don't you just come play some outside linebacker for me? And it also, add insult to injury here, Mike Stoops is an analyst at Alabama. And while he's not you know, directly involved in recruiting, and I don't think he's involved in recruiting at all, according to NCAA rules, but he had a very close relationship with Drew Sanders. So you know, at the bottom of all of this, Dave, is always some interesting stuff. So... Oklahoma had the number eight recruiting class in the country with Jace McClellan as a hard commit. Now, 
I think that's off the board, right? And this is also interesting because when you look at team rankings, you talk about Texas had fallen behind Oklahoma because they lost a flip commitment in Quentin Johnson, a six foot four, two hundred ten pound wide receiver out of Temple, to TCU of all places. So it lots of moving and shaking going on around here. And I understand that this day is a little bit difficult for some people to get into. They look at it as fantasy football, but I would tell you this: go look at the twenty seventeen classes, and you'll see all of the teams in the top ten are making the college football playoff, and routinely the teams in the top five make it year after year after year. That's Ohio State, that's Oklahoma. Well, Oklahoma hadn't been in the top five in some years. Alabama, and of course Clemson and Georgia. So does that help situate you, Dave? Absolutely. Okay, all right. It's, it's a, we, were, we were just going through the analytics of what the four- and five-star kids, and if you're rated above a certain line, that puts you in that national championship realm. Uh, Ari was breaking some of that down. And some of it, I think, for the fan is a little bit mind-boggling, but it's, it's, it's pretty easy when you start talking about four- and five-star kids and what they do to your program. You just talked about since 2017. I think you can go even further back than that. If, you, if, you're, if your class is, uh, what, what, Ari, above that 50 percentile when it comes to yeah. four- and five-star recruits, you were in that mix to win a national title and certainly falling down the line as you look at the teams that are ranked in the top four in the country with a chance to win it. Right on. And I also would make reference to Bud Elliott's blue chip ratio rule. He came up with this, so that's why I'm giving him credit for it. It is, does your class have more than 55% blue chips, meaning four or five star kiddos, right, as ratios go? If you have that number, you can compete for national championships, and that's usually about 16 teams, right? I think this year it was like Notre Dame and Miami toward the bottom of that, but the closer you are, to 70, 75 percent, the closer you are to playing in a college football playoff and winning a national championship. And it fluctuates, right, because transfer portal happens and the team talent composite, which I think is a really cool thing for you to look at, just what are the rankings of the current crop of kids at your school? And that makes you, gives you a better understanding of just what is being done with your talent. You also look at, again, Texas they finished in the top three last year. They finished with these outstanding classes, and you expect them to compete for playoffs. You could uh, spot. You expect them to win a Big 12 championship, and I think that Bijan is going to get them on track. But with this coordinator switch and how they're closing out, it's difficult. As for Oklahoma, two junior college defensive tackles and the number one and number two junior college defensive tackles in the country to go along with, they might be able to add the number one safety in the country out of JUCO ranks. I'm also looking at what Matt Rule is doing because. Before the Big 12 championship at Baylor, he ranked 10 out of 10 in this league in recruiting, and he doesn't really spend a lot of time out recruiting. Kind of like Mike Gundy. He wants to know that you want to be here, and if you want to be here, he's going to coach you and he's going to develop you. I think that can only take you so far, and Texas Christian is an example of that, right? When Gary Patterson has a quarterback, he's competing for championships and and college football playoff spot. When he doesn't, they're five and seven, you know, and I think that's what Matt Rule is flirting with, and I would really love to see him close out and get a couple of kids in through the door that perhaps Baylor just doesn't get normally, right, uh, outside of the Bryles era. You mentioned Jace McLennan, which obviously sucks, but, but what about, is there, are there positive potentials here for Oklahoma in terms of guys that, that maybe are, will be surprises for, for the OU Sooners classes? No, man, and that's what's surprising is like, Usually you got a kid ready to go if one of your dudes falls through, but it doesn't feel that way with this early signing period, which lasts not just today, but tomorrow and Friday. And then we got to all wait till February for what's called National Signing Day. And I understand that some people feel like that's lesser signing day because, as you mentioned, more than 50% of the kiddos will sign today because they want to get onto campus. Many of them will be at their respective schools at the end of the week, right? They want to get here before the bowl games. And an example of why that's important Derek Stingley Jr., who's a freshman corner at LSU and returns punts, got to LSU before the bowl game. It was so good. Dave Aranda said, I would have played him if I would have been allowed to play him. I just wasn't allowed to play him. And Ed Orgeron said he's going both ways next year. So a lot of these kids are also trying to get into the door at other schools, which is to say that anybody that you would want, that you could get in right now, you would want to get them in right now and get them on the program because the kids that show up in January – outperform the kids that show up in June, just as a rule. So to answer your question, no, and also that puts you behind the eight ball because now you don't get to develop those freshmen that you really want. And I'll add this for you. Only Charleston Rambo, Trajan Bridges, and 
uh, Jaden Hazelwood, Theo Weiss return next year as wide receivers for Oklahoma with experience, right? So all of a sudden, you're going to need all these true freshman kiddos to start playing and fill out your depth because you're going to lose guys like Nick, Nick Basquin and C.D. Lamb and a team that I thought was going to be really good next year with the addition of Jason McClellan might, might be a little bit suspect. RJ, I had a chance to do the uh, the SEC title game here, and, and it was my chance to do the up close and personal. You got to rub it in, Dave. And that's going to be a, you got to rub it in. That's going to be a hell of a matchup between Stingley and CD Lamb if they can if he shadows him and follows him around the field, which LSU does some. Sometimes they'll shadow their corners with with a particular wide receiver. Uh, sometimes they lock them on one side, and but I, I know one thing: when CD Lamb lines up on his side. That is going to be worth the theater now. Those two guys, obviously we know what C.D. Lamb is, and this Stingley kid is a big-time player. See, Dave, thank you for validating me once again because I said like two like two months ago, the matchup I wanted to see was Derek Stingley and C.D. Lamb. People was like, hey, man, nobody cares. And I was like, okay, we'll see. And I, I really want this to <laughs> I want it to happen too, right? Because for me, you don't just have the Heisman winner. You have the Bolitnikoff Award winner and the Paycom Jim Thorpe Award winner. And I got to tell you, a lot of people – in the room when we're doing the selection of trying to whittle down the list of three finalists, it's Grant Delpit, man, back there pulling the strings as well. And what's he going to do? Is he going to shade to one side or the other? Are they going to leave Stingley out on an island? Is he going to follow him around? Many people think that Christian Fulton might be a better cornerback than Derek Stingley is right now. Would that be the matchup? No, man, I'm excited about it because I sincerely think that Derek Stingley Jr. has an opportunity to be one of the best corners to ever play this game just on evaluation and how he has handled his business. I, I've been banging that drum for a very long time. But I would ask you this, Dave. If you know that you want to get C.D. Lamb the ball, why not just line him up in the slot more often than not and try to force a safety to come over and cover him or to take Derek Stingley off the edges, to give, get him away from a boundary? Because I think that's the only way you can really take advantage of that because I still don't trust Jalen Hurst to put it where it has to go. No, it's a great point, uh, RJ. I think that if you can get him in the slot, you can move him. What you do is you begin to dictate what LSU is doing from a coverage standpoint. You're going to get an early recognition pre-snap for – for Jalen as to what's going on. And you're also going to put guys that are in, in comfort, uncomfortable situations. If I move Stingley to the inside to shadow him or, or follow him, now I've got somebody on the outside that maybe is my third corner, fourth corner that's maybe playing against Rambo or somebody else, which creates a matchup problem and maybe a continuity problem on how they want to do their coverage, either man or zone. So I think it's a good point. Yeah. Um, all right. Great stuff. Great insights as always. R.J. Young. All right. All right. Uh, with his. All right. Can I ask Dave a yeah. question? Is that okay? Of course. Oh, Dave. I thought, I thought you were about. To, I thought you were about to respond there. That's that was the pregnant pause. Oh my it bad. I, I I well I'm gonna shift gears here. Uh, Dave, we lost Hayden Fry last night, as you very well know. I know that yeah. you were on those Iowa State teams in the early '80s, and you got an opportunity to play against that '83 team that was a monster. I wondered if you would share a memory. Of, of Fry or even playing those Hawkeye teams back in the day? Well, Hayden Fry, I appreciate you saying that, RJ, because I had a lot of respect for Hayden Fry. He's a Texas guy, and, and uh, he actually opened the recruiting lines for Iowa to get into Texas to bring kids the really good players out of Texas up to Iowa to play, and there were a number of them that played for Hayden Fry in Iowa City. But he was, a, he was an intimidating guy when he came out and was not an intimidating person, but he was an intimidating guy, big guy, kind of Texas big, if you will, that when he rolled out of the tunnel uh, and his guys played with a ton of discipline and toughness. They were extremely tough, hard-nosed, hard-hitting guys. You knew you were locked into an all-day fight when you played Iowa, uh, especially with Hayden Fry at the guy and uh, at, at, the, at, the, at the controls. And, and he was an old-school dude, and, and he loved his kids. But there's a story. I remember there was a number of kids I talked to that played at Iowa that I played with in the National Football League. It told the story one time. He said, hey, we practice rain or shine. And I go, what are you talking about? He said, well, this is back in the end. There was no indoor facilities, right? He said, we had lightning striking all over Kinnick Stadium with lightning the scoreboard up. We were getting ready to win a game. That was the hard nose to now. You can say, hey, that wasn't very smart or anything like that. But that was just the toughness and the hard nose mentality that Hayden Fry had. But he was a genuine human being that loved his kids. And he was Texas big, man. That's all I know. Oh, man, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Dave. And Ari, thank you for allowing me to ask Dave that question. 
Of course, man. Be well. Thank you for your insights, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon, brother. All right, fellas. Thanks, guys. See you, bud. There you go. R.J. Young. Kind Love of the talking. passion, man. There's yeah. nobody that we get on that has more passion about what he does than that guy right there. He energizes you. You love the energy that he brings. He uh, does a great yeah. job. R.J., appreciate you, man. R.J. Young from the Tulsa Sports Animal, OU 24-7, and on YouTube. Make sure to search R.J. Young and, and do a subscribe to his YouTube page. Thanks, man. Enjoy the day.